Hello, welcome. We are on our video series here on inverse functions and we're now on part two. And what you're going to see here in part two, if you want to watch, I hope you do, is we're going to look at some more notation. Woohoo! How does this stuff work? Some really cool stuff with the arrow diagrams. It's going to help us understand inverse notation. And we're going to look at the inverse function property. Very cool. And I think we'll leave it there for this video. So let's get started. And the idea of these arrow diagrams is that you have some shape that represents where you're starting. Let's call it A. In, our, in this case, it's where we're starting with our function, so we'll call it our domain. And then where we end with our function is called our range, or B. So the arrow diagram allows you to specify exactly what's happening. So let's say we're in here. We're picking some x value in our domain. And you want to get to some output here. It's a function. So we'll call that function f. What the function f does is it takes these inputs in, from a and it maps them to outputs in b and we'll call those outputs y. Well the idea of an inverse function is it goes backwards. It takes that output and takes it precisely back to the input you started with which is why it's important that your function is one to one to begin with which means each of your outputs only have one input to travel back to, right? If there are multiple inputs here to travel back to, and they all, let's say this is x1, x2, x3, they all got you here, we don't know where to go back to, so we're a little bit stuck. But assuming our function is one to one, then we can find its inverse. Let me clear that off. And the notation, which I was in the last video, is something like this, the inverse of f. It doesn't mean one over f, it's not an exponent, it means the inverse. And then we could write this here with some notation in our definition. We could say that, all right, well, f of x equals y. And if there's an inverse, if that happens, then you know that the inverse of y, based on the inverse function of f of y equals x. It's just an if and if, if and only if statement, which means it's an, a two way if then statement. So we could start here by saying, if this is true, if f of x equals y and the function is 1 to 1, then the inverse of y equals x. But you can go the other way. You can say, if this is true, if the inverse function of y is x, then f of x equals y. It's called if and only if, and it goes both ways. And this diagram allows us to approach what's called the function, inverse function property. So in, I don't want to write it in red. It's just too harsh. Okay. Inverse function property sounds really cool and it is really cool it's really convenient and really powerful I love this property okay the inverse function property in mathematical language first says if you take a function and you compose it of its inverse you're going to get X but if you do the opposite if you take an inverse and you compose it of the function itself you also get x. And let me show you what it means in a diagram, and then I'll write this in kind of a friendly language kind of way. Um, let's start with this one. This is actually the easier one to start with, taking the inverse and composing it of the function itself. Now, we are going to, again, set up a, an arrow diagram. Okay, We start off at a, we go to b. Now, when we're composing functions, we really want to start here. So f of x starts in a, let's say, that's what we'll suppose, takes those inputs and maps them here to f of x. We called it y in the previous diagram, same idea. That's what f does. So first you, you apply the function f on some input x from a. You apply it and it takes x to f of x. Then you apply the inverse on that output, right? whatever f of x is and you go back where you started from. You apply the inverse and you end back up at x, which is y equals x. And that's how I would describe this. This property tells you that a function composed of its inverse, or vice versa, I'll say this, a function, I'll write it this way for now, a function composed of its inverse, or an inverse composed of the function itself, a function composed of its 
inverse. Maybe I should say a function. You know what? An easy. Let me, let me fix this. A function and its inverse. A function. Composed. Uh, I'm struggling with the language here. A function uh, composed of its inverse. I, this is. This feels lame. <laughs> or vice versa. I don't like saying that, but I'll leave it. Or vice versa takes you back where you started. Takes you back where you started. That's important to understand that movement because here, right, we're starting at x. You take the function here, get to f of x. So that means you're com you apply f of x first. Uh, apply f to x first, and then you you're composing the inverse of f. So it takes you back where you started. It takes you back to x. And the reverse is going to be true here. And I'm going to set the same diagram essentially, but look at some subtle changes. This is a, and this is b. Well, here we're starting with the inverse. We're, that's important. We're starting with the inverse. So the inverse starts here. So you can call this, even though this is the outputs of the original function, it's the input of the inverse. So you could call this x. You could say that's x. And what does the inverse do? It's the same thing here, so I'll color code it the same. It takes those inputs over or back to a. So it takes you here. And then we call this the output of the inverse. It's f, the inverse of f, basically of x. That's what the inverse function does. This is the definition of it. So then you're composing the function of that inverse, right? You've got this now, and then you apply the function to the inverse. It's going to take you back where you started. It's going to take you back here to x. And that's what I'm trying to say up here. You compose one or the other. It always takes you back where you started. So if you started here, apply the inverse. Then you have the inverse of x, and you run that through the function f. It takes you right back where you started. And that's all it's saying. It's an incredibly important property, as you'll see in the next video and throughout the reading if you've done it. But this allows us to test whether a function and the other thing we have are actually inverses of each other, because this has to happen if they are inverses. So if this happens, then they are inverses. And the reverse, you say, if they are inverses, then this has to happen. So this is another if and only if statement. And that's going to be useful. All right. Hope you enjoyed that.